All right, so I think we're going to get started. It is my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Natalie Moist. To introduce Moist as our Moist, Moist, and this is a professor at Columbia's Behavioral Cardiovascular Health Center. She received her undergraduate degree from Princeton and is no stranger to Mount Sinai. She was here from medical school and she thereafter went to Columbia where she's been for residency in general internal medicine fellowship. Um, she's currently an assistant professor there. As I mentioned, she has a master's in epi from Columbia's Melbourne School of Public Health and a certificate of implementation science from UCSF. And she's currently the PI of two implementation science once on patient-centered behavioral health IT interventions to sustain fiber care programs in the primary care settings. So, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, so, hopefully, I'll be able to hear from you who are doing fiber care as well. This might be more interactive, hopefully. Um, so, I think I'd like to talk to you a little bit. Through conference of interest. So, let me just talk to you a little bit about the history of collaborative care and where we are in terms of implementation. I'm focusing on some of my more recent research on barriers and facilitators to sustaining collaborative care, um, and then identifying ways, more brainstorming ways to incorporate health and care. So I'm going to put iPads in our waiting rooms to activate patients before their visits with their providers. And so this is something that we're trying to expand, and we can use some feedback on. So um, I'll spend the last bit of the talk. So a lot of my early research focused on the relationship between depressive symptoms and cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. So a lot of the research looked at depression and baseline and then followed patients for 20 years, 10 years, and said, okay, if you're depressed, you have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease mortality and all-cause mortality. But depressive symptoms relax and remit. And so there's been some recent research that it's really if you have persistent symptoms that you have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease mortality. Um, and then I've been really focused on is it every time you're depressed, it can be an increased risk? And so we did something called time varying uh, analyses and <clears> found that every time you're depressed, you have this short term risk, not, not due to suicide, of all cause cardiovascular disease and cancer mortality within about three to five years. And we found that this was particularly true in people who stated that their health was excellent, as opposed to people who said my health was poor. So both of them had a significant effect, but particularly there's a a significant effect modification if you said, I have excellent health. And then inside of, among those people with excellent health, particularly those people who were young and male, had an increased risk of short term uh, cardiovascular disease mortality and all cause mortality. And some non CVD mortality, mostly attributed to uh, cancer. And so this is adjusted, we adjust it for everything medical conditions, all medications, behavioral factors like exercise, we adjust it for. Uh, medication not adherence, explanatory factors like CRP, health status, still found um, in these adjusted um, analyses uh, <coughs> a significant effect. <coughs> started looking a lot of my research also looked at why this is going on. And so we found that all of those groups that I talked to, male, young, uh, people with excellent state of health were less likely to be treated um, than others. And so it could be that providers are less likely to recognize depressive symptoms if you have excellent, pretty good health as opposed to the patients who have more chronic conditions. And then in patients with heart disease, there's been a lot of research that shows that depression is a risk factor. So if you had a heart attack and you have elevated depressive symptoms, that's a risk factor of having another heart attack. Um, and so far, treating the depression improves your depressive symptoms but doesn't stop you from having heart attacks. So we've been really focused also on the fact that uh, maybe our group has been looking at behaviors. and so. It's mostly medication, non-adherence, smoking, physical activity that's mediating that relationship between um, depressive symptoms and recurrent events in people with heart disease. And so we're, we're, we're starting to think that maybe we should be focusing more on behavioral interventions um, as well as treating their depression in those groups. Um, and then we've done some really interesting work looking at depression as a central, as the connector between diseases. And so if you have cardiovascular disease, we think that depression might be the connection between cardiovascular disease um, inflammatory diseases, for example. So we've done some network analyses and other um, research. And finally, unexplained things like hormonal, neurological um, factors may also be in play as well. I mean, obviously, our kind of broken healthcare system, workforce, and not having enough therapists, uh, insurance issues are all potential factors. Other factors on the provider, this is on the science level. Earlier research looked at 
Uh, so we have patients with high blood pressure for several visits. So elevated blood pressure is over goal for two or three visits. And um, we found that on that third visit, if you were depressed, um, doctors were less likely to titrate the medications in terms of your antihypertensive. So you might also be under treating them from a cardiovascular service perspective. This is controlled for the level of your blood pressure, medical problems, uh, whether or not you're adherent, and even provider effects as well. So there are some suggestions that your depression causes clinical inertia um, amongst providers, which can um, affect treatment of your cardiovascular. So after doing a lot of epi work, I started focusing on five um, actual interventions. So I think all of you guys know what cooperative care is, you can manager um, in a clinic, who works with a psychiatrist, provides um, public solving therapy in a way that's more um, population health focused, and titrate medications, et cetera. So this program has been effective, very effective. So looking at the history of collaborative care, this started probably in the 1970s. It's a huge study that came out saying that 50% of patients of community-dwelling individuals were depressed. Um, and about most of them were receiving care in their primary care setting. So the 1980s and 90s saw a lot of research on prevalence of depression in um, primary care settings, comorbidities, um, gaps in terms of how providers were titrating or treating their um, depression in those types of patients. And then people started becoming interested in um, interventions in the 1990s. So notifying the provider whether or not the patient was depressed seemed to improve some quality outcomes, but not really their depressive symptoms. And so um, in, in 1990 and 1996, you see NIMH, HRQ, sort of funding, part of the care trials. And this is around the time we have this kind of chronic illness model of proactive follow-up, adding non-physicians into um, the team the infrastructure. So by the 2000s, we've known that this model is effective. It's particularly effective in minorities as opposed to other groups. Um, and more recently, in the last decade, <coughs> where I am right now, in terms of my research, there's been a big push towards expanding this into large healthcare systems, um, looking at whether or not cloud care is effective in patients with heart disease, um, and I do OB settings and community settings, et cetera. So now we're at this kind of place in the implementation world where we know this is effective, it reduces mortality and cardiovascular disease risk, which is something I've been really interested in. There might be some long term. So I know Kaiser Permanente has some um, outcomes in terms of implementing cognitive care may have long-term um, effects in terms of depressive symptoms. It's pretty cost-effective. Um, we're now reimbursing um, for cloud care. Lots of policies have come into place in terms of <coughs> recommended depression screening and treatment. It's a lot of opportunity for implementation um, of this. We're actually kind of past implementation a little bit um, for cloud care. So now we have all of these groups trying to end it. So if you want to implement cloud system, you have to identify a high-risk group like diabetics, start there, do some formula evaluation, maybe start in a single site and, and spread this widespread across the system, document. Um, there have also been some really interesting studies on how do you communicate and change people's behavior. So you might tell your leadership to your communications and leadership and say this is going to save you a lot of money. Uh, providers might tell them that uh, somebody else will be able to manage depression for you, care manager will feel more active. So there's been a lot of research on how do we get people to implement this program. There's been a ton of research on barriers. We know there are kind of barriers, lack of resources, space, um, implementation readiness. And I think we're now in a place where we know that there's a bundle that needs to be in place for us to even think about implementing collaborative care. We need to have some kind of financial plan at a state level, at a um, national level at the very least. We need some kind of training certification program. And unfortunately, these programs probably only work if there's an external person, the state, et cetera, monitoring you, really, is what we're trying we're starting to realize in terms of needing this implementation level to be in place. So the literature is also starting to come out in terms of how effective these are in the real world, so outside of research settings. Um, so this is the Diamond Trial, which was done in Minnesota. They had a really large um, cloud care implementation effort across that state. Um, lots of quality improvement um, projects, et cetera. Doesn't, it's not looking so effective, which is a little bit concerning, but if you look, their response rates in terms of depression is similar in the usual care and the intervention arms. But the, the thought is that that response rate is actually similar to the original trials, and that maybe the usual care is a little bit more effective um, than they would have expected. So they were having a lot of quality improvement initiatives, et cetera, but 
some of the pieces that they found was, again, intensification of non-responding patients was a huge issue. Um, so thinking that you need to put an external program, that these programs need to report their outcomes in order for them to be uh, effective. So this is where we are right now in terms of how do we now sustain these programs, um, thinking about health IT interventions and other pieces. Um, and so I was fortunate to work with the Office of Mental Health. I know you guys are a site as well. I interviewed you guys. You were part of my uh, cohort. Um, so OMH and DOH implemented collaborative care in 32 clinics across New York State. So this is in 2012. So these were clinics where residents were trained. So that hadn't been done before. These have mostly been community settings prior to this. Um, and again, the implementation of the bundle. Training, they provided funds for a startup. Um, tech assistance, and then the big piece was monitoring. Um, so these clinics had to report how they were doing every quarter, uh, whether or not they were quite paying attention to it, at the very least knowing that they had to report to OMH how they were doing, that was one added piece that they added. And then in 2015, this is the first time they did a fee for quality reimbursement structure. So you would get, so per, per patient that you enrolled into cloud care, you could bill about 75% of this one. And then an additional amount to show that that patient improved over time. So this was one of the first time that they've done a more of a blended fee for quality and uh, assistance. And so in 2006, I did a mix, I led a group doing a mixed methods analysis with the stakeholder interviews with the original clinics, and found that about 26 of the Euro clinics had decided to keep doing collaborative care over time, and six had opted out. So we were really interested to figure out what was going on, why would people kind of leave money on the table in terms of opting. This is the early, this is their kind of post implementation um, data. So you can see here that screening rates did well. They had very similar response rates as the original trials and the diamond trial as well. Um, and these were amongst all 32 clinics. Then what, at the end of implementation, there are certain differences that you can see between those clinics that have sustained and clinics that have opted out. So the main <coughs> thing that we found is that the sustained clinics tended to be larger. Um, and they had a full FTP, so a care manager FTP, in those sustaining clinics. Uh, and they basically were much more effective in terms of these are medians, not means, but in terms of clinical improvement, they, the percent of their patients who actually showed clinical improvement was about 46% as opposed to 7.5% in opt out clinics. They also used half an FTP, so most of those care managers were doing diabetes work in addition to managing depression as well. So this could have been contributed to why they ended up opting out in the end. Was there much difference in the in the settings? Like were these all sort of practices providing care to high risk and city populations like this one? Or, yeah. You know, how much variation was there? So all in terms of the of residents, all of the <coughs> pretty high risk chronic disease, sick patients. These were sicker and might have been more so one of them was a little bit outside of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, of the opt-out. Of the opt-out, exactly. Um, they were definitely smaller, felt more like community settings a bit mm -hmm. than, but the sustaining clinics, several of their community setting clinics yeah. did quite well. Uh -huh. And I think the, the main difference, we looked at a lot of factors, was really, despite the fact that they were smaller clinics, you might have thought that they could get away with half an FTE. Uh -huh. Maybe that, that was actually yeah. correct, but in the qualitative stuff that we found, those those care managers, it's just not to start a program up like this and do diabetes management is just not sustainable. Um, is that what they were just sort of telling you? This is what they were sort of telling in the qualitative pieces. Yeah. So, yeah. so we had people separate, so we had the care managers separate from the psychiatrists, separate from the PMDs, and, and so it was very clear that there were different stories. I, you know, the care managers were kind of like, it's all the PMDs' fault. Uh -huh. the PMDs were kind of like, oh, the care managers are uh -huh. not as effective. Uh -huh. uh, the administrators were like, this is everybody's fault. So, so does that also, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. But does that speak to sort of how it was sort of fashioned within the practice? I like, think was there so. poor communication yes, between there? Yes, there? that was a huge barrier. Poor communication. Uh -huh. Um, despite the fact that they had to report to OMH, right, they had the training, mm -hmm. they were part of um, the program to some extent. And so you could tell that, I will, I'll talk a little bit more about this. <coughs> they lost their psychiatrist, like it was a, it was a very difficult um, experience for them. So yeah. they obviously did not want to continue with this program. One of the centers, on the, so what does that mean, percentage of overall six months on meds, there's a big difference in sustaining an opt-out. 
Are those people that they're enrolled in six months and they're on medicines? Yes. So fewer people were on medicines in the sustaining clinic than the other clinic? Um, so that meant they had to stay, so they had some really weird metrics, like okay. they had to be in the program, so a lot of the patients were no longer in the program at six months if they'd already been, if they'd already improved and opted out, so those patients were not improving already, so it just meant, the, the, the denominator is starting at a very different point, so that means that the patients had to have been enrolled in the program, still in the program for six months, and on meds and therapy, and so if you look at the denominators actually, not just the percentage of, of individuals, um, there were fewer patients who were st who, the opt out clinics had more patients who had to be enrolled for six months, who were still not improving, still on meds and therapy, still not doing quite well. Um, and so it's a little bit more of a, a complicated, nuanced piece in terms of the 15%, but I can't completely explain that. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what, yeah, I'm not sure what that means. But I do know the denominator. They had many more patients who were just not improving over time. Do they all measure mechanically improved when they all use the Yes. Yeah, so clinically improved. Um, so basically that meant that they had to be enrolled 16 weeks and have a PHQ 9 of less than 10. And this is slightly different than what other groups have reported. So they've done a 50% improvement rate. Uh, so response meaning that they improved by 50% and OMH wanted to make sure that, you know, what percentage of patients who were enrolled had a THQ of less than 10. That's a slightly different metric than other stuff reported. Any other questions so far? Um, so what happened to the sustaining clinics? And so after, so after <coughs> they were gone, what happened to the kind of three years, five, six years post implementation? So screening rates stayed pretty uh, persistent. They added new metrics like percent enrolled with three contacts, and then they again changed <coughs> the clinical improvement definition um, to be percent enrolled 70 days with a PHQ of less than 10 or 50% improvement in their PHQ. And so that baseline is slightly different for right there, but that continued to improve over time. So the clinics that stayed in this program just kept getting better in terms of their improvement rates. The only thing that fell over time was the number of patients enrolled per care manager FTE. So over time, this baseline one year, two years, and now this is six years after, after implementation, there were fewer patients per care manager. Um, and we tried to delve a little bit into this. The number of newly depressed patients did not change over this time. So it wasn't that the prevalence rates of depression were decreasing. It's that for some reason there were fewer patients enrolled per care manager. We also tried to explore, explore, is it that maybe they weren't reporting all of the patients? Um, because OMH was only paying for patients who had Medicaid, right? So maybe they had more patients, but they were only reporting. With, but we also explored some of these pieces as well, and that didn't seem to explain. So this is the only thing that dropped over time, is that the number of patients that were actually showing up to care manager programs decreased. Were they increasing the FTEs of the um, care manager? Um, one cl a few clinics did, but some clinics actually went down again. But this is per FTE, one FTE. Uh -huh. So that piece, the FTEs haven't changed. Year two is what year? Um, 2017. I wonder if the, as we look at the Medicare, a lot of our patients are Medicare. were switched over to Medicare billing. Yeah, so, so. we this, this happened in our um, qualitative so we did explore, and so I know maybe your clinic might have been different, but a lot of the other clinics said that their the patient population had not changed. So even this, we looked at these within subgroups. So even the clinics, we asked them, we called them again and asked, you know, have, has anything changed in terms of the type of billing that you're doing? And they said most of the clinics in the qualitative interview said that it was getting harder for them to recruit patients, to have patients show up. And this could be that the only people left were the more resistant. Um, a lot of the kind of more excited patients might have been enrolled during early implementation, but um, what they were finding is that there was still the stuff and PHQs were still positive, but it was harder for them to get a patient to show up and enroll. Yeah. Is there any thought that um, so these improvements over time were perhaps associated with you know, lower caseload? I, that's, that's what I suspect too. Initially it was great. I was like, great, this is perfect. <laughs> um, kept getting better over time, and so this is what we reported back to OMH as well. And like, it looks like that could be because. 
But it's an important, it's a, it's a critical issue. Yeah. You know, any case management you know, program, there's all this debate about, yeah. you know, what's the, the rice volume. And it's always being sort of pushed, like with the, you know, with the Medicaid health homes. Yeah. It's like tremendous yeah. pressure to, yeah. like, sort of maximize the number. I know. But, and all the community based organizations are arguing that, you know, we cannot possibly manage at this rate, yes. uh, you yeah. know, these yeah. very sick patients Agreed. you know, on a low Agreed. PPM. We do that a lot, and the AIM, the AIM Center recommends 80 to 100, which is like really crazy, <coughs> yeah. right? But I still think 30 is still too low, probably. Yeah. Uh, my understanding, too, like IFH's model is a little bit different than ours, so that yeah. it's really not every patient is getting therapy. Yes. And a lot of those patients are just getting yeah. kind of very simple touches like they're used to taking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not the case for us here, but I yeah. think our numbers are kind of closer to 60. Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a wide variation there, and so, but still, it's that was the only piece that, uh, so this is if patients enrolled. So these are still, even the people getting the low touch calls, et cetera. So that 36 is like a, um, yeah, great. Uh, but it seems that the overall impact of the program then is declining over time. This is, Focus on those who are in the program, they're getting better, but if you say that a few patients are enrolled and you know, all this stuff, then the overall impact in the clinic exactly. is diminishing. Exactly. Right. Especially if you think that depression is still prevalent and is staying the same. So that's the huge concern. Um, and um, so we started qualitative interviews, so 31 interviews, sustaining and opt out clinics. Um, you know, we base our interview guide on a diamond trial that looked at fidelity factors associated with collaborative care implementation success. So having a do you have on-site access? Are you doing warm handoffs? Can you identify your PCP champion? And so what we found is that the sustaining clinics, so this is in the, this is in the sustainability phase, um, sustaining clinics were actually at very high fidelity, right? So they're still screening patients. They're still having weekly multidisciplinary rounds. They're still doing great. They still have psychiatry experts you know, dedicated to the program. Um, they have a PCP champion. The other great thing is that they had more than, I want to make another point about the declining rates. The reason OMH's clinics are so concerned about this is that this is tied with billing. And so how can you sustain this program if these rates start dropping, right? So um, most interestingly, we're using funds outside of OMH. So the administrators had to get funds from DISRA and other programs to still fund this program. Um, and then this, these were the kind of, in the clinics that did the qualitative piece, these were the caseloads for care manager. Still, their remission rates were still you know, similar um, to what we, were, we saw reported. Opt-out clinics. So when we got to the opt-out clinics, they couldn't even tell us any metrics. They had no idea what, how many patients were being screened. Um, they mostly had 0% FTE for psychiatry. So they couldn't identify who the psychiatrist was for their programs. They did not have a PCP champion. Um, they were spending most of their time coordinating care as opposed to doing treatment and therapy. Um, case loads were slightly lower than in the sustaining, but still low across the board. Um, they had no idea what their remission rates were. And so it was pretty clear that take home points number one is that staffing matters. So those smaller clinics, um, assigning just half an FTE clearly wasn't effective. So you need a full time person tasked with ensuring clinical outcomes from the get-go. Um, and I think our message to OMH as well is that these lower resources, and you can't just give the same resources to all clinics to start this program. So contacts matters, lower, lower resource settings may need additional early support. Some have pushed back at me um, and said that maybe we should even implement collaborative care in those settings. Uh, they, maybe they should be, if there's so few resources, maybe we really should be focused on their diabetes program or hypertension, et cetera. And, um, so that's been a debate right now in terms of maybe not every setting is appropriate for collaborative care. Maybe they need integrated care or something, another type of model. Um, and then clearly the structural rules of payment reform encourage most clinics to, to continue participation. It seemed to boost long-term fidelity at least and perhaps outcomes. Um, but the main thing is enrollment um, drops, though it tracks patients per FTP remain the same. So clearly having those structural rules, having um, OMH there to kind of monitor things keeps the fidelity very clearly. People still screen, they still have multidisciplinary rounds, 
Um, at least they can report their metrics and other pieces, whereas the um, opt-out clinics would have been pretty poorly, even worse, without OMH over time. Did you check whether there were any differences in the case mix of these clinics in the sense that I feel that a big driver is what percentage of your patients the system is at risk for, and that's going to make sense from a financial perspective to do all this investment because at the end of the day you save, but if you are like most in a fee-for-service environment, then that's this is extra expenditure. I know you do it for the patients, but you know, yeah, that's yeah. not maybe really that's always a different thing. So. That's a very good point. I think you're absolutely right. We have, we we're not able to look at that. I actually still have the data. We can actually go back and see those opt-out clinics in terms of the, we're now doing the cost effectiveness analysis, which isn't looking very good um, across the state. So, um, but it looks like hospitalizations and ED visits increased over time. So that's that was the last, some of the earlier data. That's not helpful. And it could be a lot of those people. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, yeah. some people think that it could have been a good thing because now they're plugged into care. Maybe right. they're more likely to take care of their health. So uh, I'm not sure, but uh, we'll have to see. Okay. So these are the qualitative pieces. What were barriers <coughs> uh, in the sustainability phase? So. The main things were things like training, leadership support, funding, registry stuff. That those used to be the in early implementation. Those were the big barriers, and those weren't as much mentioned in sustainability things. So these kinds of things start getting better to some extent. And the nice thing is that people didn't feel like funding was not and not everybody's you know, mentioning funding as a huge barrier. Um, the main pieces. So these are the sustaining and opt out. So the opt out clinics. Resources were a huge barrier. So clearly the part-time care manager, they don't have time to do a warm handoff. Um, they have trouble contacting their care manager because they're being pulled in so many different places. So these are the kinds of things that opt out um, PCPs were saying. And then lack of psychiatry resources. They felt like it's very hard to keep a psychiatrist engaged in a program like this long term. In the beginning, everybody's very excited and um, right, but over time, Sometimes you'll get a fellow who just graduated, who's really you know excited about a program like this, but you know, five years later it becomes impossible to keep those people uh, excited about this program. Uh, and then sustaining clinics blamed everything on the MDs. They said that then, uh, well, at least the sustained PCP said this. You know, we're already getting hammered, and I'm gonna say we, we are getting hammered with lots of things that we need to do during the visit. We have to screen so many things for ACOs and all of these other pieces that we have to do, and so this, for a lot of PCPs, without the PCP champion in the room, or other people in the room, were saying that they felt really overwhelmed over time um, by having to think about the COVID. And there are, a lot of, there are a lot of PCPs who don't want to deal with depression. They feel uncomfortable having to talk, if they would rather manage hypertension, et cetera. Um, so that's one thing that we did also. And patient engagement was a huge, so number two, so they said, you know, care management doesn't change the fact that there's still stigma, there's still all of these other barriers to patient engagement <coughs> uh, that have been here in psychiatry for years and decades, et cetera, and then PCP motivation as well. So um, PCPs weren't always referring, they didn't always think that the patient was depressed um, after speaking to them, so they didn't always refer patients to care management programs, and then a ton of miscommunication. Uh, so things that the care manager said that it, sometimes it felt odd to, you know, SHM or a secure health message, a PCP to titrate medications as the kind of go-between between between the psychiatrist and the PCP. And so um, in some clinics that was a little bit of an uncomfortable uh, thing to continue over time. So things that people recommended for facilitators were doing more personalization, education, motivation, warm handoffs were things that everybody was talking about. Out, but just didn't have time to do. Um, standardizing psychiatry time, a lot of clinics propose doing e-consultation so that the psychiatrist didn't actually have to be in the clinic. Um, audit and feedback was something else. So it seemed to be very effective from OMH's perspective to do audit and feedback of um, the care managers. And so that, so that, you know, it improved their intensification rates and all of their the fidelity piece. But should we be doing audit and feedback of providers and PCPs? Um, something else that some programs were doing. So they would show PCPs their list of patients who were still depressed who had never been referred to collaborative care um, as one way to kind of uh, encourage them. And then obviously the opt-out clinics needed more care manager FTEs. And then paraprofessionals were things that um, programs like yours really recommended in terms of having another additional person 
help the social worker practice at the top of their license. So it's a good equipment reminders, check in, and treatment goals, etc. And then the external final and finance piece is still always one of the main issues. I talked to you guys about that 25% fee for quality piece. So they got funds to enroll patients, but nobody asked for additional funds to show improvement. And it wasn't because they weren't showing improvement, it's just so much work to then send OMH all the patients <coughs> doing well. You have to go through the chart. And, and so they're starting to realize that they need a more automated, you're going to fee for quality, you need something that's very easy to measure. You can't pick something that's difficult to Okay, so patient perspectives. We also spoke to a lot of patients who had been referred to collaborative care. So half had actually shown up and half never showed up. Um, and so from the patient perspective, they said there's been a big push towards team-based care in primary care settings, but nobody has really explained to them what that is. Who are these people? We have a lot of people doing cold calls and their care managers, but without explaining um, what this program is. Um, still the same self-efficacy and preference. A lot of patients told us that they know that the PHQs are coming and they just put zeros. And so they know not to, um, <laughs> to, to kind of, to, even if they're feeling bad. Um, and so they are, they know to kind of game the system and what will happen if they say yes to any of these questions that are clear, it's very clear that it's coming. And so we saw a lot of patients tell us they, they know to, even if they're depressed, even if they're suicidal, especially if they're suicidal, they're going to try to do zeros on their PhDs. Um, and then still transportation and cost and, you know, you know, embarrassment, shame, cultural stuff, my doctor. You know, we had a lot of patients tell us that they'd rather that their PCPs not deal with their depression because then they might not take their chest pain seriously and they might not take their, you know, all of these other... We have two types. And some patients felt that... Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're hesitant to include depression, so they want their doctor to do the EKG and to take things seriously. Um, but others said that they didn't go because their doctor never explained. So they were referred, but they had no idea what they were referred to. And so there were a lot of people who actually said the doctor didn't really explain, that they didn't really like that. Um, and that they didn't, a lot of, most of the patients loved the warm handoffs, but some felt that it was just an additional person that came into the visit and it was kind of uncomfortable, uh, you know, they'd already just had this discussion with their provider, and it just was more stressful to have somebody else now come and keep talking to them about the program. So uh, it wasn't as clear cut as one would think. So the main thing that we got out of the patient um, piece is that a lot of this hinges on the provider more than we would have wanted. Um, and OMH and collaborative care has been so focused on care managers, psychiatrists, what happens in the care manager program and not as much on that referral period. So either the provider has to address these, there needs to be a warm handoff, you're going to have to do a cold call, or the patient for any of these to be addressed. So there's a lot hinging on, I think, the referral period. We also talked to 10 experts across the country. So Diamond Trial, AIM Center, well, anybody who is an expert in collaborative care, um, we tried to at least touch base with them and did a very formal stakeholder interview them, and have analysis, et cetera. And again, they talked about patient engagement related to, we asked them, you know, what do you think is driving patient engagement issues? But again, related to motivation literacy, and they also told us again, this piece about not, a lot of providers, especially residents, not feeling comfortable treating depression, talking about depression, and then still this inadequate screening diagnosis systems issue. Um, and everybody keeps talking about one hand we'll talk about it in a second. So, Still difficult to implement, but again, a move towards individualizing these two patients upstream before they're even referred to the that we discussed those. So take home point number two, basically patient provider engagement and care manager resources remain key barriers in the sustainability case. And this could be because of champion turnover, implementation drift, but really this leads to an inability to generate billing the reason we all make program. Um, and then for patients, a lot of upstream discussions with providers, warm handoffs, explanation of team care and education might impact activation. And for the stakeholders, they really thought we needed to focus on provider comfort, traditional patient barriers, um, because a lot of the focus has been on the care management program once the patient's enrolled and not how to get patients into the program. And we looked at other studies. So Diamond Child's is starting to come out with their enrollment rates as well, very similar. So over time, about 40%, and in low English proficiency, even lower. 
so even fewer of those patients. And what's interesting about that is that this program has been shown to be particularly effective in minorities, and it's the minorities who aren't actually showing up to care management. So that's the So this is where a lot of my research has been now. Uh, so looking back at correlates of, others have looked at correlates of collaborative care success, or having strong leadership support, PCP champion, and five care management role, on-site care managers, all of those have been correlated at least in the literature to patient activation. Um, and then remission rates are having an engaged psychiatrist, feeling like cost is not a barrier, and more handouts have also correlated with a six-month remission rates in some of the prior literature. Now we're starting to be interested in what are there better trials? Are there... So this just came out a few months ago. I'm still not convinced yet. I think there still needs to be more research here. But um, this is a study of about 3,000 <coughs> patients um, in integrated health. Or have you guys seen this trial already in the study? No? Um, so in uh, the behavioral health setting, so they had mostly collaborative care setting. Um, and they were able, they instituted something where they had to enter into the EHR every time a warm handoff was done. There was something that the PCPs and uh, the administrators could put. And so um, about 21% of the PCPs used warm handoffs. And so that means that they introduced the patient to the care manager during that visit. It didn't look like doing a warm handoff was at all associated with attendance. You know, this was adjusting for the medical, behavioral, demographics of late time. It was really the only thing in the model that seemed to be uh, significant was appointment schedule. So same day is very hard to do, um, but at least within a month, uh, that was strongly associated with um, attendance rates uh, for that behavioral health. So again, this was just a warm handoff noted in the EHR, and this is a retrospective analysis, but this is starting to suggest that because of all the resources invested, you know, involved in warm handoffs, at least this gives us some equipoise in terms of thinking how effective is this. Um, and I think we need more rigorous uh, RCTs for this. I just add that to that point. Yes. So like anecdotally, we probably have all talked about this, that we've had, we've had a lot of trouble with warm handoffs in our clinic, and we, are, and we actually, because of the care manager, we have two MTs, which is yes. in most places, yeah, are usually yeah. engaged at that time. It's hard to come over. It never works. It, that's that's everybody fine. told us the same thing. So because of that, this, we just started in, for a and we probably will continue this, is trying to have the patient, rather than focus on warm handoffs, trying to have the patient leave with an actual appointment. Exactly. It may not be yeah. in one month, that's where we're struggling with yeah. one month or six yeah. weeks or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now they're having, having people call like the administrator directly yes. in the visit so they leave with the appointment. Yes. So we're hoping that will work. Yeah. We'll start the right. meeting in probably a couple mm -hmm. weeks, but we're hoping that will over time. Yes. I think that's smart to do, especially since it does, I'm not convinced that this works. It doesn't make sense to put all of these resources and everybody's telling us the same thing as well, as opposed to trying your hardest to, and we, I've looked at some literature about different scheduling um, um, interventions that people have done in terms of scheduling more than you think, assuming that there'll be a high notional rate, but um, people are starting to look at different ways for, uh, for us to kind of address this appointment delay piece, which seems to be the biggest predictor. Yes, of course. Yeah. You know, on your last slide, uh, it's like you had found that the uh, six month remission was associated with one. That's a correlation. So they just put it. I mean, it's, it's another step. You know, this was a, um, they just put, and this is a little, this is the, again, this is part of the diamond trial, which is a little bit of a messy trial in and of itself. They didn't have all the data. It was based on self reported people they could find, PCP recollection of warm handoffs, <laughs> like um, they were happening. Yeah. And so, that is like, they have enough, yeah. enough resources to have some of the available people. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, this, this is why we're moving away. So this study has been, you know, people have been touting this as, okay, let's focus on these pieces, um, but these are just correlations based on mm -hmm. some self-report. Now people are starting to start, like, let's, we need interventions to actually um, figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, power professionals, which I know you guys have in terms of an administrator. So there's been, there's no research on whether or not adding a power professional to this model improves outcomes, and I think there needs to be in terms of, I think, what we're starting to think about um, intervention that they can test to see how effective this is. Um, some of the, uh, and the research that I found with power professionals, they, they've used power professionals plus self-help um, to treat depression. Um, it seems to improve anxiety, uh, but very high dropout rates um, compared to mental health providers. 
for using community health workers in general to provide interpersonal counseling in low middle income countries. I know that's been affected, uh, but so far unclear if that's incorporating CHWs into the care <coughs> uh, uh, model. Some a reviewer for the paper that I've been talking about um, pushed back on how excited I was about paraprofessionals and asked that we uh, downplay that in the discussion. Um, and it would be a very interesting point in that we're if that person is doing warm handoffs, that's now a third person in the process. So now you have your care manager, you have the administrator, you have your PCP, and that might overwhelm patients. It might do the opposite effect. And so it's not clear that having that person do the warm handoff as opposed to the care manager or her health herself um, is that effective. Although there's some continuity, right? That's the idea. Is of the administrator, of the, but the, the paraprofessional, program. right, is having some continuity. Yeah, where... but they're not going to be the one who provides the <coughs> therapy, I guess, in the end. But yeah, that we, I, I thought, I think it seems like it's a program that would be that would work. But I think what they're trying to say, mostly for stick to like the registry management and a lot of the admin pieces, as opposed to using them for patient facing pieces. Yeah. But yeah, I can see patients thinking this is just one more person in my team. I think management, PCP, the administrator, um, who is easier for me to contact than the care manager, right? So, but... I mean, it's it's pretty clear that that's uh, an effective element of the sort of the CHW, or the care coaching model, is yeah. that continuity. Yeah. It's yeah. not yeah. so much of sort of the professional expertise as it is about sort of the hand-holding. That's true. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I suspect that the, you know, the right answer <laughs> is somewhere very patient specific. Yeah, um, you're right. That's and true. and yeah. that's you know one of the big challenges of uh, figuring out how to allocate these resources. Yeah. Is which patients are working. That's true. And we also saw that most of the uh, the sustaining clinics had these administrators. So clearly they all thought to hire this person <laughs> separately, basically, to pay for this person. So clearly there's something about this that's that's effective, at least for those clinics. And none of the opt out clinics could afford that um, admin person, but maybe something else to consider in terms of if they had this additional person, in addition to the care manager, might that have helped their program? So what yeah, actually think, works? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the other point to consider here is like these programs are not in the vacuum. And here we have a you know care management for the BBC HF and the yeah. post is chart. And then you say like it's good to have one FTE for this and they do school focus on depression, but then yeah. Five different care coaches call you, and then yeah. like, from the patient perspective, all gets fragmented, and one That's of them true. don't touch to each other, and then yeah. everybody's doing their own thing. That's so, true. That's true. You they know. were quite there, and that's a very interesting. I, and it could have been, I think, it might be skewed in terms of those opt-out clinics, in terms of half FTE doing, but that half FTE was doing some pa different patients for diabetes right. and different patients for depression. It might it just be one person doing all of this together. And you're right. So managing because they're so related. So there have been some, there's been research looking at this. There was a study, it was published in the New England Journal, where they had a collaborative care program for diabetics and um, CHD patients. And that was very effective in improving depressive symptoms and LDLs and their, and so focusing on both, but they believe that that was effective via the provider. And so <coughs> the reason is if you look at the tables in the supplementary material and you look at actually what, what improved over time, the patient behavior never changed. It was really that having that one person who was focused on depression and uh, their diabetes or their heart disease, that person then um, regularly you know, emailed or messaged their provider to titrate meds. You know, your patient's blood pressure is still elevated. They're they're not taking their blood pressure medication. Why don't we change to a you know combo pill, et cetera? So managing both their depression and their heart disease and diabetes that seems to be a potential model that might be effective. So just to put down that, but yes. I think one of the issues and one of the issues that we experienced here is that we our program is very um, therapy based. Yeah. They're, they're not doing very much care management at all, yeah. um, except or for around depression mm -hmm. um, and. We found that in order for them to become really skilled in therapy, they had to mostly do therapy. Yes. And so if you talk to geriatrics folks whose social workers are doing everything, the therapy piece is more challenging for them to maintain and to really like do well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I guess it, it probably really depends on the patient's needs. Our patients really wanted and needed therapy. therapy. Yeah. And so they feel like that is really helpful. Yeah. Um, That's a good. And I think it would be overwhelming for our care managers to then manage that. 
On the other hand, they do ask their patients, are you taking all your medications? Yeah. Did you go to see your doctor? And so they are always encouraging them to follow up with that stuff. I think, I, I think you make a very good point. And I, and it depends on the degree to which adding maybe a few <coughs> more components, because some people think they're through therapy and more behavioral activation, they can actually get the patients to improve their adherence and focus on those pieces. And so finding ways to apply the keys. So we did a systematic review, because the literature was all over the place, to figure out what actually changes behavior. So a lot of the research prior to this had focused on, we got patients to feel like they want to do this. We got patients to say that they're more willing um, to say that, that, that to be more engaged, but not to be actually improve treatment initiation, that the patient showed up to some kind of mental health provider, et cetera. Um, so things like treatment preference um, seem to be very effective. So even without this, this is separate from collaborative care. And just telling the patient you have options and you're not going to be forced to do anything before you send them to care management or et cetera, um, is pretty effective in getting patients to actually show up, knowing that they're going to have a lot of options. Um, and then collaborative care obviously was something else that's shown to include treatment initiation, case management as well, um, access, QI stuff, things that there's not enough evidence. So not that the evidence said that they're, they're not effective, but there was not enough evidence. Um, or decision aids, anything involving motivational interviewing or patient activation, cultural tailoring, except in one collaborative care in instance where they did cultural tailoring within a collaborative care setting and that seemed to um, so the active ingredient, and we will talk about this for collaborative care that I don't know is always happening, is the patient activation, treatment preference, and coordination. A lot of the patient activation and treatment preference piece happen once the patient arrives at the care manager, and not always prior to sending them. So in terms of the patient preference, so treatment preference matching, a lot of these trials were done when only medications and therapy were the options, and I think that's still the case. But when you ask patients, they still prefer face-to-face -face counseling over everything else. Um, antidepressants number two, but we're starting to see a little bit more in interest in group counseling, especially amongst African Americans, actually. Counseling by phone, which I know care management, the care management programs do. Um, but self-help apps still not a ton of interest amongst patients in terms of that being the way that they receive therapy. Um, a little bit more interest in online counseling than I thought, and then we found if you expanded the options to everything, you improve the willingness of engaging in at least one treatment modality. And so thinking about treatment preference, not just of meds versus therapy, but trying to expand in terms of the modality um, is something that uh, is promising in terms of treatment. Something else that's coming out to help you, so if a patient chooses medications, how do you decide which one? So we spend a lot of time titrating and finding meds and switching meds, and there's been a movement now, um, this is a colleague of Adam Shepard who's at Yale, uh, did a machine learning model, and they basically found clusters of symptoms of depression, and found that certain medications work for certain clusters, um, and that you can eliminate a lot of the kind of trying different meds, and et cetera, it, and so this is actually available already, um, where you, based on your PhD and some other answers, you can actually um, identify the antidepressant that would be the most effective for that patient. Um, so this has been very exciting so far in terms of the types of research that he's been doing. He's personalizing the antidepressant selection. And the thought is, might this at least help treatment persistence? Because we lose a lot of patients by having to like switch meds and find different meds and other things. So patient activation, treatment preference, and coordination. So what about in within collaborative care settings, including the motivational interviewing and treatment preference? Um, and so we've been developing patient-centered tools to put in the waiting rooms to augment the collaborative care process, help with billing, help more patients there, um, actually attend. And so we're doing a rapid cycle implementation strategy where we have this team, we have a creative director who helps us create, who's in marketing, who helps us create the patient-facing tool, send this over to an intervention team of physicians, patients, and care managers who refine the tool, then on to a behavioral expert, user test it in our clinic for 10 to 15 patients, and then keep doing this over and over again. So we, um, this is based on basically leveraging behavioral change theory. A lot of this is just behavior, right? And so language, literacy, stigma, self-efficacy, the, the behavioral health world has been, uh, has identified. So there's a huge interest, and now there's a, a tool for um, creating an intervention that's behavioral health um, driven. So you can map, based on the barriers that you identify through qualitative interviews, et cetera, 
can map the able change functions to those barriers and create an implementation strategy. So we know that education helps with knowledge, for example. So we've been adding things like Spanish and English videos, information about depression and class, all the things that the patients told us they need to hear before we refer them. Motivational stories from a patient who went through collaborative care, behavioral activation, focus on treatment preference, they're telling them they're going to have a lot of preference, they need a lot of options, um, they won't be forced to start on the medication necessarily, um, and then a preference report is generated and given to both the provider and the care manager, So, which tells them your patient does not want meds, your patient's interested in therapy after the activation piece, and um, also the barriers. So, but they are having trouble with transportation, they're having family issues, other reasons. So, we're, we get paper copies of our PHQs, and so this is just stapled on the back of the PHQ, is the, the product support of the patient. So, we've now been user testing this in about quite a few patients, and so it tells them their score, it tells them what it means. Um, we're actually getting higher rates of fewer false um, negatives for the PHQs because it it's voice activated, it goes through each one very slowly in terms of the um, PHQ. Um, and then the care manager explains what collaborative care is and, and other um, steps. So we've done this in about 29 to 30 patients from the first round that we're still user testing right now. And most of the patients have been minority, um, low literacy. A lot of them said they had internet access, but mostly adult, child at home or in their home, not necessarily something that they so this is something that we really focus on because um, there's been a huge drive to do more mobile health pieces, but that's amongst individuals who have internet at home, as opposed to a lot of our patient population who can't access um, um, tools like this in terms of iPads and other pieces. So I won't go through this too much, but we've added a lot of functionalities to improve usability. So uh, icons and voiceover functions, culturally developed videos. The one thing that, that patients told us that they really wanted help on, information about pain and how to talk to my PCP about depression. So a lot of the patients said that they walk into the room and the first thing we say is we might mention their blood pressure or their diabetes, um, and they might want to talk about their depression, but they just don't know how to bring it up uh, to their PCP. So added ways to talk to your doctor. What we've noticed so far is that Usability scale for us, so 68 means that it's ready to go, it's usable. Um, and so English language patients in our different versions have seen improvements in usability in English and Spanish as well. We're still working with the Spanish speaking patients. Um, and then more patients are saying that they would, be, they would feel comfortable using this tool in the waiting room. We're going to be testing this across our um, clinics for implementing collaborative. And I'm doing very similar work with heart disease patients. I told you that this is a population where, um, where we're trying to figure out if cloud care works. And so things like exercise or another treatment modality, cardiac rehab, and depressed post-ACS patients. And so we're again trying to activate them to get into cardiac rehab and or therapy and that as well. And that's basically it. So, you know, there are obvi as obviously the efforts to test and implement collaborative care of the last 30 years. Um, I think that sustainability will require the fiscal incentive, incentives and accountability, which we saw, but patient and provider engagement, care manager resources remain key barriers. There are a lot of innovations in private care in the way of testing formally one handoffs, testing for our professionals, some of these health IT and telepsychiatry, um, OMH now is supporting telepsychiatry as another way to kind of offset um, the burden on care managers and making actually a lot of the care managers like the fact that maybe they can work from home and it makes it easier for them in terms of the telepsychiatry piece. And the patients, this is, there's definitely a need in um, middle age and younger patients in terms of having that as another option. Um, and then obviously the patient preference and personalization and moving this towards um, cardiac and cancer patients who have a lot more to lose from depression than primary care patients. And so especially the cancer patients, depression. Um, is a risk factor for poor survival, and treating their depression actually prolongs their survival, but they have even lower rates of therapy use and um, activation than primary care patients, so that's another grant that we're working on more recently. And that's basically it.